my joke about you surviving and stuff been stolen, so we can just uh, start. And uh, I'll try to make it quick and uh, not to keep you away from the beauties of Prague, the beers and the party that is uh, coming as well. So we can probably have a, a longer conversation there, which would be way better. So a lot of talks have been given uh, on this conference and um, this is one of them, uh, Path of a Creative Leader. So let me just add something to that introduction, uh, which was not really secret, but still. I'm a serial gamer, uh, UX designer and interaction designer myself. Uh, I like uh, taking creative challenges and uh, really creating and working with the products that do turn hats and um, deliver impactful business results. But uh, more than that, as I been a designer at some point, there was an urge kind of like what is going to be next. And as soon as I got, you know, like uh, presented with an opportunity to become not an individual contributor, but a leader or a manager, I was, of course, enthousiast enthusiastically jumping in for that, unaware of the challenges I had. The time passed years, basically, and I found myself being a design manager at the moment of 40 talented uh, people uh, spread across five different locations. So I run a distributed team with as many nationalities um, um, as well. And um, it's on its own a quite interesting management challenge that I have to tackle. Our expertise sits around user experience and interaction design for our games, but as well for the services and ecosystem um, uh, design and design strategy as a whole. But more than that, what always kept me up at night is not just how to um, work with the operational management, but the aspect of what does it make, uh, what, uh, what does it make a good, true creative leader. So today I wanted to share with you a couple of um, myths that I had to uh, debunk when I was a rookie and was just uh, um, getting into this role. A couple of uh, questions that I keep asking myself on the way to still stay relevant and um, a couple of beliefs that do help me advancing further. But before we go any further, I wanted to figure out something about you. I was hoping that there will be less people and we just like say, yeah, I know you all and st stuff like that, but we can still do this uh, uh, exercise. So how many are you already managing people or leading them? And uh, how many are you just became managers who kind of like really uh, new with this position and uh, leading? Defining leading, this is the whole presentation uh, about, so I'll, I'll be <laughs> de defining it uh, a bit more in pieces and so on. So, but the short one would be, you're managing people by authority, but you're leading people that follow you. And, yeah, you manage? <laughs> Great, uh, but I hope you are leading him or her as well. So, and uh, how many go guys are in senior or director level design positions? Great, great. And uh, um, anybody else who is left uh, doing other things just uh, here because you have nothing to do or didn't get to another talk uh, where the guy is serving vodka or something? I recognize people, thanks. So, um, we can start actually with the first myth and the first myth is pretty, um, Simple is the summit. So when I was a designer, I always thought like, yeah, I'm gonna get to be a manager and then I'll be able to make all of these uh, important decisions and I know how to run the team. I know how to make it proper. I'll be making my very own and autonomous decisions on like the processes, the priorities and everything else that I'm being responsible for. But as soon as they reached that level, I realized that actually the summit was not the top, but very bottom and there is like the whole way I had that I have to tackle. So at some point um, I was talking to my friend and he introduced me to the Peter principle. Um, it resonated with me a lot, maybe because of the environment that I work with. I don't know if you uh, know about this, but this is ac actually about the tendency in uh, big organizations with hierarchical structures that uh, do rely on people getting promoted in the new roles, that whenever you get promoted, you actually uh, do not stop there because you're competent and then it's, uh, within some point you're gonna get promoted further on up until the point when you're in a role where you're not competent anymore so you cannot prove that you have to be promoted for any further 
And if you follow what I'm saying, then it means that on a lot of hierarchy levels, you have incompetent people. And uh, me, myself, as a manager and as a designer, when I realized that, I was afraid that I'm one of them. So I was trying to stay on top of the things and actually understand kind of how to overcome that and how to not be in that position of an incompetent manager that is not going to be promoted any further and as well taking the creative challenges. So one of the way, this is kind of like, you know, the uh, simple graph. One of the ways to, to overcome this uh, and this is the ideal way is by the company to provide you with an appropriate uh, training that is corresponding or appropriate for the role that you got promoted uh, into. In my experience, it rarely happens simply because there is no such practice in the company and you were, or they were not prepared for that or you have to instantly kind of like extinguish some fires or you have to rally the troops right away. So you better be very aware of that and uh, do your homework, not to leave it to the chance. So, and it brings me to the next myth that I had to debunk, and this is the myth of mastery. I'm still kind of like dealing with that, but as a creative person and a designer, I was probably wrongly kind of like expecting that the skills that I had and my experience, this is what brought me here, and this is definitely what is going to help me to advance further. And at some point, I understood that more managing uh, I will be doing, less design I will do. And it actually made me really kind of like be in a bad mood, trying to understand kind of like, is that what I want or, and so on and so on. But when I came to, the moment when I came to peace was um, after actually talking to a lot of people around the industry, being in similar positions, and actually uh, talking to um, a mentor of mine about that and to the boss of mine, and they had completely opposite uh, um, opinions on that. But I came to an opinion that it's actually not the end of my uh, career as a designer. I can still be a designer, but I can be guiding and directing people forward in, uh, that are implementing the design. So therefore, I can be even more helpful uh, because I can influence you know, like, uh, multiple people. And the second thing that I understood is being a designer is actually a pretty cool thing because I'm in a unique position when I can tackle leadership and management challenges from the design point of view. I can dive into them, do the research, approach the uh, stakeholders, figure out where the problem sits, and apply all of the design methodologies that I uh, used to work with. A couple of examples uh, that I think stand out in my career over here, and that really kind of like um, I approach from the design point of view, were designing the organization that I work uh, in. A distributed team of 40 people that has been changing over the time is not a simple task. And I had to understand kind of like what we are facing over here. What kind of like challenges are there? What kind of like uh, difficulties are there? And uh, what do we need to, uh, to do to be competitive even though we are distributed? And there are a lot of great collocated teams that are way stronger and that are set up for success in a better way. Another example that you see right now on the on screen is because I inherited some guys, I came to, the, uh, to them and they were pretty much kind of like unaware where they are, what skills they have, on what level they are, and so on and so on, because the team was immature. And uh, the only way to grow this team further was uh, sitting with the challenge of designing the uh, career path for them. And this is the document uh, that describes every single skill, every single level, and it shows every, um, uh, every uh, team uh, member that we have where they are and what they need to do to advance and be better. So the last myth that I wanted to um, share is a kind of like rookie mistake that you're hoping that you have and you're going to have an absolute power as a, as a manager. And probably it's actually true. As a manager, you do have a power. And that's actually coming back to our question. But uh, you cannot expect that people you command are going to actually respect you and instantly trust uh, you and they will follow you as a leader. So those two things were um, the things that I had to realize at some point. And uh, uh, the main thing was like that trust and respect is not granted with the title, but uh, uh, you have to work for it and you have a chance, it's 36 days, 100 days or something like that. The other challenge with the power and actually uh, control, let's say, 
sit with me managing a distributed team, meaning that I cannot be physically present everywhere where I have the guys. And we have people working in different offices, we have people working from home, we have people working from co-working spaces. And I totally cannot be sure about their performance or about their emotional state, or even about kind of like if there are any kind of like problems in the projects by simply being there. And uh, it instantly leads to, at least for me, you know, to um, a conclusion that I have to micromanage them. I have to kind of like be sure that everything is going according to plan. But at some point it was taking so much from me that I was like on the way to paranoia, simply because of uh, the nature of people. You do not really trust each other. And uh, uh, when you have some guys, again, kind of like working remotely, you really have this urge for micromanagement. So the only way to overcome that was for me to really come back to me being before friends like as an art director or designer and trusting my guys way more. And instead of kind of like trying to control them, I started to handing out them uh, priorities, not tasks, and give them a creative freedom actually in how they want to execute them. This is uh, um, <clears throat> because we've been talking about that within the team as well, and this is the representation done by one of our designers, Camille, um, about this whole situation and paranoia that everybody is like in a different location and you don't really can, like understand what's going on. And that's the clicker. So the thing you have to do here, you are constantly clicking the answer Skype and you have to deal with all of this kind of like red um, exclamation marks. Otherwise my patient gets low and uh, you know, the game um, ends. So um, the next question I've been asking myself uh, uh, to keep on the top of the things is uh, actually who you are or who am I? And in this case, um, it's important to understand that if you're leading people, they're looking up to you and they do expect some something and designers in this case, and I'm really happy to work in this industry, especially in game development and with design discipline in particular, are very demanding individuals. They have the self-awareness and more than that, uh, you know, like our team contains like different nationalities and meaning they have very different mentalities and very different backgrounds. Uh, that was the initial idea to create this team to serve our different uh, markets with international expertise and unique skill sets that are hard to kind of like get in one location. So the question was, am I ready to lead them somewhere? Am I ready to bring something new to the table? Uh, and uh, actually, I was really kind of concerned about like what defines me as a creative leader. And then I started to be more aware about like what I play, which is important like for us, of course, what I read, what I watch, uh, where do I travel, kind of like what kind of experiences that I am absorbing, and uh, what kind of uh, information and uh, inspiration I can give back to the guys. And pushing yourself out of comfort zone was. Uh, um, actually preparing me for the future and uh, actually helping me to be a better leader for the guys. Not least, but out of this uh, um, actually list is who do you speak to? Who do you talk to? Who is your professional and uh, personal network? What kind of like topics do you dis uh, discuss with them? Yesterday, if you've been to the talk of Paul Burnett, he was mentioning like that you have to surround yourself with interesting people, probably to be a more interesting person yourself. And I truly believe in that as well. You have to have as diverse network over there simply because other people feel differently and they would provide you um, a different perspective on things. And then therefore you can address it um, with your design challenges or with your team. And you can actually um, be more diverse yourself. So one of the approaches uh, that we uh, employ within our team is we do encourage everyone to travel to the locations where other guys are sitting. It doesn't matter if it's an office or just like somebody lives, for instance, like there. Uh, it's semi-official official because they have to pay for the travel and accommodation themselves. But they do not burn their vacation days. They have a, a possibility to um, not wait for a business trip to happen, but just like to go where they, wherever they want and spend uh, some time with the uh, team members they have. Those are just a couple of uh, photographs from me because like I'm based in Amsterdam, so that's a pretty popular location, uh, which ended up for me 
feeling at some point that I'm not living anymore in my house, but that's a bed and breakfast for people just dropping by and visiting. But I'm happy about that because through that, I could be more open and transparent with them and I could learn way more about themselves as well, because usually they would come with kids, friends, wives, girlfriends, boyfriends, and so on and so on. And it creates a better bond, because as a distributed team, we have to value every single moment when, that we can spend together. So the next question was around the same area, but a bit more uh, critical. And, um, I form it as like, have I got the balls to, as a leader, you know, like to abandon the past, to make bold decisions, change and adapt for the future as the team uh, uh, manager and as a uh, leader myself. And uh, most important, am I ready to stand and commit for something meaningful beyond my personal agenda? Meaning that I'm not driven by my very own goals, but we are striving to do something better. And as designers, that's the value that we bring. The answer to that is the courage to risk and take damage, I would say, as well. Because if you're doing things differently, there will be a lot of people um, constantly kind of like questioning your decisions and attacking you maybe in a way, maybe saying that your ideas are naive or maybe your ideas are plain stupid. And the only way to sustain that is, for me was the answer in my like previous uh, life and design skills because like going through a lot of iterations on the project getting a lot of feedback to the work that you do develops a very thick skin and that's the uh, thing that i have to you know like bring back to the team and i have to um actually share it with with them as well so the other important thing of having the balls is am i ready to make or like let people fail but not to be failures this is the most intimidating because like you're responsible for the quality and your team should be performing well and you have to be doing the best possible kind of like things and uh, uh, i'm in a position to put designers to the right projects and for me this matches one of the uh, reasons for their actually best job ever kind of like that they can do over there but if the fail happens then use the healthy approach to collect some lessons learned from it. And we employ in our team uh, something that is pretty common for the friends like agile teams and so on and so on. So we do retrospectives after every single uh, project done, or we do post-mortems if the things went really poorly. What's important, and it might seem quite rough, but it's far superior, superior than making and repeating mistakes again. If you manage, um, to do these meetings without finger pointing or name calling and uh, you have to be constructive and actually be coming to some of the points that can be actionable afterwards. So the next question that I'm asking myself, and this is specifically because I work in a big organization and driving the discipline of UX and design in a large organization is a pretty kind of like difficult thing and it's a long-term commitment because things do not happen uh, overnight, especially because like UX is not that, you know, um, mature in the industry itself. So it requires quite a lot of preparation and the hard work and it's most likely is not going to be a sprint but a marathon that you have to be ready for. Therefore, you better start trying to understand the environment where you're in, the organization, and trying to get the big picture, because it's gonna help you uh, in whatever you're planning, whatever innovations are you trying to uh, propose, whatever cross-functional collaborations you are trying to pull off. And where to start, for me, it was always an easy answer. We have an org chart, and an org chart is not just like your list of names, it's a group of potential allies and if you want to be successful in this organization and if you want to really kind of like support your initiatives and drive, for instance, like in our case, UX or interaction design any further, you have to forge alliances. So the thing I figured out that one of the best tools I had are my legs, just like stand up, go and talk to the people. Secondly, I figured out that actually the, the, the most important one is liver, of course, but uh, um, it's, it's another story. So I got into the habit meeting up with engineers, different stakeholders, or um, even executives trying to understand their roles, what's their agendas, what do they expect, and how can we be helpful. 
answering these questions for a long time was pretty helpful and still helpful, even on the projects where we work. And you never know how uh, and when they will be actually in a position to influence the success of your team because they can support it and support uh, or sponsor it. There is no need for the agenda. There is no need to, you know, like just prepare for that and try to kind of like get something very specific out of them because usually it's not going to be a case. I have a couple of examples, for instance, like whenever I even travel on a business trip, I am trying to spend my time like every single evening or every single lunch with somebody that I don't know or somebody that I do know, but uh, still kind of like do not waste this time because like I can learn something about the company, I can learn something about the people. And it's important because I can understand what their needs are, where they are, how mature their understanding about the UX in general, and I can evangelize or educate or just put it on their radar so they would be aware that this discipline exists, this is what we are doing, and this is kind of like where we are going with that. Speaking a new language, that's just a, a simple advice. And uh, um, there were a lot of talks that designers can code or designers can do animations or motions or whatever, like especially users or uh, interaction designers. In my opinion, designers should learn uh, business language. They need to speak uh, to people and especially executives and uh, managers in a language that they do, do understand. And this is what is lacking in a lot of um, teams and a lot of organizations as well. So uh, this is another example. Um, I got an opportunity at some point to pitch an idea to our CEO, Victor, and uh, my slot was in um, San Francisco during the GDC, had an hour, and right before that moment, uh, I had a call like one hour before with our entire team, and we were doing the dry run. Why it was important? Because like they provided the support to me, even though like they were on a completely other kind of like, side of the world with different time zones and so on and so on. But they believed in what I'm going to be pitching because this is something that's important for our team. This is something that we do share. And this is something that we are doing together because otherwise it's impossible to turn this machine kind of like, you know, this entire corporate battleship. So on this positive note, I just wanted to talk a bit more about the beliefs. There are three of them and we are done. And, uh, you know, like you're uh, happy to go. Uh, one of my again, kind of like uh, personal responsibilities as a creative leader and a manager as well is to build and sustain culture and philosophy of our team. And uh, uh, usually what I learn is that people do not uh, uh, follow you or they, they do not come to, uh, to their jobs every single day and they do not stay there and they do not have fun because of what we do. They go there and uh, uh, they do it because of why we do it. Especially designers and creatives are very egocentric people and uh, at the same time they require a really strong set of values they, that they need to believe in. And usually it's like making a difference, not just another interface or a set of icons or I don't know, um, what our task is out there. All designers are striving to solve interesting problems where their work can make an impact and uh, um, their work uh, is usually kind of like about like why are they doing that? So this is the most important kind of like thing. Respecting their value in this case is uh, very inspirational. And uh, uh, at some point, just to get it out of the conversations, we decided to put it in something more tangible. So we created a design doc, and I involved uh, everyone from the team to help me out, like uh, figuring out like what is our philosophy and everything. The interesting th thing that happened is. At the very beginning, uh, I handed them, uh, them a draft and it was like having a vision and mission and they came back to me and said like, hey man, like, if you want us to believe in that, uh, we need to agree on one rule, there will be no corporate bullshit and only the stuff that really matters for me. I was like, yeah, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to commit to that and uh, I'm happy to do this uh, all together. And this is actually why do we exist and everyone on the team knows that and everybody uh, on the team uh, believes in that. We are pushing the boundaries of uh, uh, design within our company, within our uh, products, but we are pushing them and we are striving to push the industry as well. And this is our goal. We are not just creating, for instance, products. We are creating the top-notch products. And top-notch products for us mean the great experience for players. And then uh, it means that our business is successful. So, yeah. 
I managed to get some of the corporate uh, uh, stuff in there anyway, but uh, this is indeed what makes uh, the question why solid. So my role then becomes a bit of a different kind because I, I need to make sure that we are staying true to ourselves. And uh, to make sure that this is happening, I need to be aware of who do we hire because the team grows as any healthy team out there. And whenever you're hiring, you don't need to hire people that are just like in need for job or money. You need to hire that do share the same beliefs as you have. You need to hire people that are here to achieve for the sake of achievement. People with strong intrinsic motivations, something that we do have as values and we do have as a core in our team as well. But to make it really work, uh, we rely and believe in the process, which is kind of like controversial because we are supposed to be pirates and dreamers and creatives and designers and so on and so on. And process is something very kind of like solid and strict and uh, to some extent bureaucratic. But I actually uh, share uh, my opinion on here and I was surprised uh, about uh, um, Mike Hill uh, talking about that today. But uh, they even have a process and a very detailed one, which is really helpful for the art production, for um, art creatives and uh, people from that industry that uh, uh, in my case, I guess it's a bit, just like a bit uh, uh, different. But we believe in the process, not as something kind of like completely strict and set in stone, but something more kind of like flexible. And even though at some point, because like we work with a lot of different teams, they are spread across the world. They have their own um, expectations and so on and so on. We defined every single phase of the design process. And it has information about what the roles are involved, what kind of artifacts are gonna be kind of like uh, provided as a result. But the main reason for that is that our designers and our creatives are not spending time figuring out like how to do things and what to do. They're doing their job. They're busy with solving the problems and creating better products. Therefore, we even give them the templates over there, just download them, fill them in, because like we value design documentation. And uh, therefore, for instance, like developers, when we're handing over this documentation to them are happy as well. This is why business analytics are happy with us kind of like being quite organized and so on and so on. But it doesn't mean again kind of like that we are blindly following the process. So at the beginning of every project, we have a liberty to sit with them and define like, what do we need from here? Like, so we are picking only the things and methodologies that do make sense over here. So they know what to expect. And uh, the final thing actually um, that wouldn't be possible for me to be a leader, for instance, or advancing in this path as well, or for us to exist is the belief in each other. And this is another excerpt from uh, the doc that I mentioned before, our philosophy. So I just wanted to, uh, to take a look at the first three, and uh, those are our values. We collaborate, not compete. We are skill-based, not availability-based, and we know our strengths and understand how we could improve. Those three are only possible if you have strong belief in each other. And those three are the ones that we live day by day with. And to be honest, in the industry, there is still a lot of problems because like designers and creatives tend to compete simply because they have this inner urge to be better than somebody else. So it was like quite a long learning curve for our team to become supportive. And especially because the guys are distributed again. So it helps them to be there for each other, therefore. And uh, uh, this was the trust and transparency that I was talking about before that would not be uh, possible to work with as a team without having those things. And here are just a couple of um, areas where, that we use, and I have a tons of different kind of like, you know, uh, internal kind of like processes and policies and, uh, and things like that. But I just wanted to mention a few. The culture, the culture is really important if you want to create something that people are surrounded around of. And routines, we have our daily stand-ups, we're distributed, but we have a call-in, guys are just talking about like what they do and what they're gonna be uh, doing today or tomorrow and if they have any struggles and so on and so on. You would be surprised that they work on different projects, but they still do that, but it, it works. They are well aware of what other guys are doing and their forefronts, like if they hear that somebody has a problem, they can give a helping hand. We have 
weekly inner circles, for instance. This is the design review. This is uh, another kind of like hour where we can invite our stakeholders, where we can invite somebody else. We are just like reviewing everything that has been done within this week. Guys are able to provide feedback to each, to each other. There are some rules as well, of course, but it's very productive as well, simply because we have these different, um, again, kind of like skill sets and they know like, okay, hey, I can be very helpful over here. Kind of like maybe I can uh, reach out to, to this guy or, or girl and help them. Screens in and uh, uh, drop box out. That's pretty interesting and it uh, has a relation to us being quite transparent and over communicating as well. So wherever we have a collocated office, all of the guys' screens are turning inside, inwards. So basically, whenever you're in the room, you see what they're doing and it helps in two things. One, it actually sparkles a lot of conversations and collaboration between the team and everybody who walks in the room, you can instantly kind of spot, hey, that's something interesting, what is that? And they can uh, discuss it and uh, it's a reason, you know, like just to meet that person or again, kind of like give them a helpful hand or just figure out that something pretty cool is going on. But how do you do that if you have a distributed team? Of course, like I kind of go around and uh, see somebody else's screen. All of our uh, work is synchronized to Dropbox instantly. So whenever they work, they save this file. So even if right now would not be a weekend, but just a normal day, I can open my phone or whatever, and I can see the latest version of the file over there. I can see basically kind of like the work in progress going on. And it's not because we are about control, it's because like we are pretty transparent and whoever is working with us on the project, they have the same possibility. Therefore, for instance, like, a lot of people were concerned, kind of like, hey guys, I don't know, you're in Paris, for instance. I'm in Kyiv, kind of like, how do I know that they're doing this and uh, how are, do, do I know that you're making a progress and so on and so on. Here you go, you can just uh, um, check it out yourself. It led at some point to the extremes, like open doors, even though we don't have the doors, but all of our small team leadership meetings and any other activities, everyone on the team has a schedule and they know about them and they can attend them. They never do though, but the possibility is over there. And the last one uh, that is really important for me, and I think it's really important for designers and creatives, that we again can like, um, recognize their value and we trust them. So it's a talent exposure. Our guys, at some point, I was actually fighting for that within the company with the corporate policies and so on and so on. They have a possibility to have their own portfolios and case studies posted wherever from their personal name, simply because we trust them and we recognize that they can be actually proud of their work and of what they've done and they can share it with the industry, not just like with the colleagues uh, inside the company. But for the colleagues, because a lot of our projects are uh, under NDA, of course, they have internal portfolios. So whenever you are starting to work with someone, you can go on conference, find this guy, and there will be some case studies from his past projects. So you can check it out like, oh yeah, he's pretty good or she's like amazing, you know, and this and that, for instance. Some of them are about research, some of them about uh, very visual things, but it doesn't matter. So uh, this is pretty much kind of like it, but it, since we got some time um, left, I just want to share with you a couple of more things that we employ to keep the guys all together again. This is uh, uh, one of the things that we've done at some point. This is the exercise when we just created the avatars for uh, every single member of the team. And uh, they've been using it uh, across the corporate network and for their social networks and so on and so on. And having the guys again kind of like distributed across the world, it helped a lot for them to be a part of something bigger. At some point, it became kind of like a popular thing in a company. We were asked like, hey guys, like, can I have an avatar? And we were like, first like, no, no, it's just like our team thing, you know. But then we even created a, a special tool for people like just to come up with their own uh, avatar. So you can go and create one and then there would be some avatars popping out around the company, kind of like, hey, yeah. And like, cool as well, especially uh, among non designers. So this is pretty much it of uh, what I wanted to share today with you in this late hour. And I hope it resonates with some of you with what you do or what you were going to do, what you've done before. Uh, for me, it was a tough learning curve, but rewards are great because like I can influence these people and I can influence the work that we do. So thank you very much.
Thank you, Constantine, for an amazing presentation. You really managed to lead and capture the audience attention. Dear audience, please support the last speaker with the last questions. This is your last chance. Last questions. Here. Yeah, please go ahead. Oh. Yes, but not mine. Uh, thank you. It was a great presentation. I really enjoyed it, despite it being the last in the day. Uh, my question is, uh, I don't know if it fits the e exact theme of this presentation, but I'm going to ask away anyway. Um, as I understand it, and please free, free, feel free to correct me if I'm wrong, there are two um, opposite approaches to creative leads. Uh, one is that the creative vision of, of a project uh, spreads out from one person, the author. And mm -hmm. that person is in total control of everything that's going on in, in the creative uh, process. And another one is that in the beginning, you only, you only have the high level vision and then every member of the team is, f is free to contribute to that vision. Uh, which approach do you believe works better in the industry mm -hmm. overall? In the industry overall? Um, that, that's a hard, uh, a tough one. I, I, I won't be speaking for on behalf of everyone over there, but I would say that there are like, as you explained, uh, these different approaches. There are way more of them because like you can be very strict at the beginning and then uh, loosen up and uh, give people more f um, creative freedom or vice versa. For instance, like when you're approaching some important milestones to provide more more guidance and more direction. But in my personal opinion, it's something that really fits you. Uh, your personality, because as a as a leader, uh, you have to be, and again, kind of like by the book, you have to be authentic. But on the other hand, you have to correspond to the people that you manage. You know, like because some of the people, and again, like it depends on what your team is about. Like, who do you work with? Some of the people are like to be uh, actually uh, followed or commanded or something like that. They like to work with very kind of like strict limitations, and some other guys like would be especially the rock stars or like geniuses or like, you know, this lone wolves and so on and so on. Like they're pretty much kind of like able to execute themselves. So you're just going to be standing in the way of a great creative result if you're going to be directing them too much. So uh, this all depends on you. And that's another uh, challenge kind of like to recognize what would be the best way to approach this specific project and this specific team. If you're in control, of course, like you can create the dynamic that fits you better or fits the product better. All right, thank you. Thank you. More questions? Here. Uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, there was one question and answered. What happened to the pitch to Victor? <laughs> yeah, I'm still standing here. And actually, it was answered. Uh, I answered that the, it's not a sprint, it's a marathon. You know, like, so I'm, I'm still running. We are still running. We are still trying to turn this corporate battleship. It turns in different directions though, uh, but uh, it turns. And um, it's very helpful because, um, you know, again, kind of like people knows that we are trying hard and the other people notice that as well. And there are a lot of changes um, um, happening in the company. And uh, right after that uh, um, pitch, uh, he was true to himself. He reviewed actually the first kind of like 10 action points provided and he instantly put like one on the list like that had to be executed kind of like the first one to that I proposed. Uh, thanks for the insights. It was awesome. Uh, there was on one slide the questions that you uh, asked yourself, what you started uh, watching and what you started reading. Yeah. Could you actually tell us what you, what you started watching that influenced you and what you started reading after becoming a leader? It's not like, um, yeah, the, the question is great. Uh, it's not like what I started, but I started to be more aware that I have to kind of like watch different things that I probably would just enjoy watching. So I don't know. Uh, I specifically didn't put these things over there because it would be a bit of a show off like, hey guys, I'm so into kind of like, the art scene over here or some kind of like crazy things over here or some really kind of like indie games over there and so on and so on. But uh, indeed, the, the main answer for me was that I was expanding, you know, like the area of coverage, kind of like, you know, I, I was trying to do and read and watch things that I never done before. If you don't mind, I would leave it at that. Otherwise, it would be just, you know, advertisement like, yeah, that's my favorite movie and, and again. Pretty limiting. <laughs>